Well, good morning and welcome to our PSPRS Continuing Local Board Training Webinar Series. My name is Don Minear. We'd like to welcome both of you, our guests in-house, and also those who are viewing the presentation online. We hope that these webinars provide useful information that will assist you in your roles as appointed elected members, local board secretaries, and local board staff. We here at the system look to our local boards to ensure that they administer all the provisions of PSPRS and Corp and their plans properly associated. Today's webinar is going to be on the Arizona Open Meeting Laws. Before we begin, we want to make a couple of notes presented to you that those online participants, if you should have a question, feel free to type those questions in the box provided to you in the upper right hand side of your screen. We'll be providing time at the end of the presentation to answer these questions on both our in-house and our online participants. These webinars are just one of the several training tools that we provided for our local boards. But if you'd like to host an on-site training event, please contact myself or Robert Ortega by calling 602-255-5575 or emailing rortega at psprs.com or don at psprs.com. Our presenter today, we've invited Catherine Marquette is an assistant and ombudsman for public access. Catherine joined the Arizona Ombudsman Office in 2011 after managing a Phoenix branch at the Genix Services. Catherine has served as legal staff for the Governor's Regulatory Review Council during Governor Napolitano and Governor Jan Brewer's administration. She has a bachelor's degree from Syracuse University and a law degree from Villanova Law School and is licensed to practice here in Arizona. We'd like to now turn the time over to her and uh, start our open meeting law presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm Catherine Marquat, and um, this is my first webinar presentation. I'm very excited and a little bit petrified, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I've been with the Arizona Ombudsman for about a year now, um, and I do primarily training on open meeting law and public records law. I'm going to go through a little bit about what our office does. We investigate complaints relating to public access below the state level. At the state level, for state agencies, our office does um, can investigate. We have a broader jurisdiction, but below the state level, um, I'm the only person that has jurisdiction over agencies below the state level. So county, cities, political subdivisions, special districts, um, we can only look into open meeting law and public records law complaints. Um, I'm also required by statute to train public officials and educate the public on the rights uh, under the public access law. So we put out some educational materials. We do go on site and do trainings and um, try to get everybody on board, everybody on the same page. Uh, we do not have enforcement authority. As far as open meeting law is concerned by statute, the only agency that has enforcement authority is uh, the Attorney General's office. Uh, the County Attorney's office also has enforcement authority as well as the court. Um, however, we do handle open meeting law complaints. Um, the, uh, the Attorney General's office, they'll investigate complaints and, you know, they can force your hand for us we we try we go the route of mediation <clears throat> more often and um, we try to encourage the folks in government to uh, comply with our recommendations um, and if they do not want to comply um, or have a different interpretation then we would uh, report that to the legislature um, as far as you know the the, the uh, differing, interpretations of the open meeting law and maybe encourage them to, to clarify. Um, open meeting law, a lot of people have uh, some, some misunderstandings about what the open meeting law covers. Uh, and it is very limited as far as what it covers. It's a set of laws that's set to maximize public access to go the governmental process, um, encourage open deliberations and proceedings to the public, and prevent public bodies from making decisions in secret. So um, normally I get a lot of questions where uh, folks are asking Questions related to more toward rules of order for a meeting. Open meeting law doesn't address a lot of the day-to-day 
um, processes and decisions that you're going to be making. Uh, it's primarily geared toward uh, letting the public know what you're going to be talking about and you know, giving them an opportunity to view that decision-making process. So all public bodies have to comply with the open meeting law and the public records law. Um, all councils, boards, commissions of the state, or political subdivisions, multi-member governing bodies and departments, agencies, institu institutions, and instrumentalities of the state or political subdivisions. It also includes corporations or other instrumentalities whose boards of directors are appointed or elected by a state or political subdivision. Um, an example of that would be SRP. They have a private uh, component. They also have a public component to their company where they are subject to open meeting law. Um, for as far as there's a lot of agencies or um, companies out there that um, are concerned about uh, whether the open meeting law will apply to them, there's an attorney general opinion on point. So if if you are in a situation where you're not sure if you're a public body or not, give me a call and we'll walk through the analysis. Um, public bodies also include standing committees, special committees, advisory committees, and subcommittees of or appointed by the public body. So we'll, there's a specific definition for an advisory committee or subcommittee. Um, and agencies want to be aware in case they uh, create a subcommittee. Uh, you want to be aware of what the definition is um, when you're delegating responsibility to see if you're creating a subcommittee, because that subcommittee is subject to open meeting law. So a subcommittee is any entity, however designated, officially established on motion or order of the public body or by a presiding officer of the public body for the purpose of making a recommendation concerning a decision to be made or a course of conduct to be taken by the public body. Uh, an example of that would be a finance committee. And, you know, if the, uh, if the chair, the vice chair, and um, the finance director were given the responsibility to review the uh, budget or whatever and then come back to the, the larger public body and make a recommendation about what should be done, uh, you want to go walk through this evaluation and see, or this definition and see if that falls within a, uh, the definition of a subcommittee and whether that, meetings or that meeting or that set of meetings needs to be noticed. So statutory requirements, the Secretary of State, Clerk of the Board of Supervisors, City and Town Clerks must conspicuously post open meeting law materials prepared and approved by the Attorney General's Office on their website. And what they mean by that is the Chapter 7 of the Arizona Agency Handbook. I think there's, um, they have a new revised one for 2012. I think they just put that up. I'll have to fix that. And all persons elected or appointed to the pub to a public body must review the materials at least one day before taking office. Do the folks in the room, are you familiar with the um, Arizona Agency Handbook at all? <clears throat> that is the normal reaction that I get. <laughs> I'm sorry? No, it's from the Attorney General's office. Um, so what you want to do, there's a link to it on our, on our website. Um, if you go on our website, azoca.gov, go to Open Meeting Law Publications, there's a link to the Arizona Agency Handbook and the appropriate chapter. Or you can go to the Attorney General's website, and um, I believe under Media and Handbooks, or Media Publications Handbooks, um, they would have a link to the agency handbook. It provides, it's a wonderful resource. It's a really good updated, you know, they updated in 2012. It's a narrative version of open meeting law, and it's really going to answer about 90% of your questions that you have when you're going through this process. And it has citations to all the statutes and case law that apply. So it's a really good resource for you. So as I said before, um, you know, the open meeting law is fairly limited, and this is the bare bones of it. What a public body must do, you have to provide notice, you have to have an agenda, you have to meet in public, you have to permit the public to attend unless you're in an executive session, you have to take all action in public, and you have to prepare meeting minutes. 
that's the bare bones of open meeting law. And um, when I go through this presentation, there's, um, you know, we'll talk about what open meeting law requires. But I like to talk about kind of the range between what's required and good government. Uh, there's always going to be, uh, because I'll, uh, the folks in the public aren't necessarily experts on open meeting law, sometimes I do recommend that you do a little bit more than what's required just to facilitate a service. Um, you know, a lot of times that will save you headaches in the long term as far if you go that extra step toward educating the members of your regulated community. Um, so a lot of my recommendations in this presentation are more than what's required, but um, you know, it is along that range. There's a lot of options for things that you can do to kind of go that extra step towards transparency, that extra step toward education and providing notice. Um, you know, but it is a sliding scale as far as what's required and you know how far you have to go. So providing notice. Okay, so what is a meeting? A meeting is a gathering in person or through technological devices of a quorum of the public body to discuss, propose, deliberate, or take legal action. So we're going to break that down. So how much is a quorum? I'm sure a lot of you already know this. It's a majority of the public body unless a statutory provision provides a different number. So here are some examples. Easy, easy examples. It includes vacant seats unless otherwise specified by law. Uh, this is very important. A lot of people gloss over this. So if, if somebody retires, if somebody passes, uh, and there's a vacant seat, that does not affect your quorum. Teleconferencing. You can do that. You know, these types of internet uh, meetings are approved practices uh, by the Attorney General. If you're going to have people call into your meetings, and um, you know that ahead of time, uh, you should provide some sort of statement to that effect on your agenda. Um, everybody at the meeting has to be able to hear what that board member is saying. So um, I've had circumstances where people uh, have someone uh, on a cell phone and they just put it on speakerphone and put it on the table. That's not recommended. Uh, if you have a bigger room, uh, it's not guaranteed that those fo that everybody in that room is going to be able to hear that person on the speakerphone. Um, so if you're going to have people call in, uh, make every effort to have an appropriate system in place uh, so that everybody can hear that person that's on the phone. And you want to provide a notation about who called in to the meeting in the minutes. So initial, the initial notice, it's a disclosure statement. It tells the public where you're going to be posting your agendas. So you want to put this on your website, and uh, you want to say where you're going to be posting both your physical, the physical location of where you're posting and uh, where it's going to be on your website. The cities and towns may use an association of cities and towns website. Special dif districts can file this initial notice with the county clerk. This is a sample in the Arizona Agency Handbook. Uh, when you guys go online and look at the Arizona Agency Handbook, they have uh, a bunch of sample forms at the end. So you can use these as a template. So notice of meetings. These are your agendas. You're required to provide 24 hours notice in advance of the meeting to all members of the public body to the general public, and 24 hours may include a Saturday if the public has access to the physical posting location. Um, it can't include Sundays or other legal holidays. So if your physical lo posting location is within a building that's closed on Saturday, you can't use that for your 24-hour calculation. The exceptions to the 24-hour notice requirement are recess and resume and actual emergencies. We're going to walk through uh, what those two exceptions mean. Um, contents of the notice. Name of the public body, date, time, place, address, and room number must include an agenda or inform the public how to obtain a copy of the agenda. 
Um, I strongly recommend that you post an agenda. I, I haven't seen a lot of public bodies that just inform the public how to obtain a copy of the agenda. I strongly recommend that you post a copy of the agenda. Posting the notice must be posted in all locations identified in the initial notice in that disclosure statement where you said we're going to be posting at X, Y, and Z locations. You have to post in all those locations. You can't cherry pick which uh, locations you want to uh, post in. And you must post it on the website unless there's an exception for special districts. And you must give uh, additional notice that is reasonable and practicable. So if you have a meeting where you know a specific target group is going to be very interested, you might consider in providing you know, additional notice um, that is going to notify them that the, that issue is going to be talked about. So notice of meetings, there was some recent legislation, I believe at the end of 2010, um, that talks about how it, it required many more agencies to post on their website. Prior to that, you weren't required to post your agenda on the website, but this legislation uh, required most state agencies to have to, to post on their agenda on their website. Um, I got a couple calls. There's, you know, special districts, they have may language. Um, cities and towns, they have shall language. They have to do it on their website. Um, I got a couple calls from people saying, well, what if we don't have a website? Well, in order to comply with the statute, you have to get a website. So that's the only uh, option um, that, that I could think of. So a few tips on posting notices. Uh, make sure it can't be removed, that for, especially in small communities. This is a big problem. Uh, if you attach it to the post office with a thumbtack, and you have some angry folks out there <laughs> that want to cause, cause an issue, uh, it's very easy to just go off and go up and rip that agenda off and say, oh, well, you didn't post there. All the action that you have at this meeting is null and void. So you want to make sure it can't be removed. Invest in a case. Uh, make sure the front and back can be read. Uh, and have a regular practice. Um, Make sure that you're posting at the same time for every meeting. Um, have, make sure that you're documenting when it's being posted. So if somebody comes and contends that it was not posted 24 hours in advance, you have records that say when it was posted, who posted it, and you're able to, to justify that. Um, I had, uh, and just be aware that folks in the public don't necessarily know about this 24-hour requirement. So if it's your regular practice to post three days in advance, um, and then one meeting you don't, it might not be an open meeting law violation, but uh, those folks out in the public certainly think that you did something wrong or that you're trying to hide something. So just try and do the same thing every time so it doesn't give the appearance that you're trying to hide something. So recess and resume, this is one of the exceptions to the notice requirement. And this is a situation where uh, this would apply in a situation where you have maybe a lot of public interest in a uh, particular subject that you're going through. And you want to allow all these people to talk that have showed up to the meeting. Maybe it's getting late. Maybe the meeting's going on for three hours. You can recess that meeting and resume it at another time without reposting that meeting. So a public body may recess and resume a properly noticed meeting to a later time or date by making an announcement at the meeting what agenda items will be covered. You can't cover anything outside of the original agenda, but you don't have to re-notice that meeting. However, if you are going to resume more than 24 hours after that meeting, you should repost it <laughs> because people expect that you're going to post 24 hours prior to the meeting. So um, I, I know the Attorney General's uh, handbook does recommend that if more than 24 hours go by, that you should repost that agenda. Um, 
but you you do have the option to resume the following day and within 24 hours and not have to satisfy that 24 hour notice requirement. Emergency meetings. I'm not sure um, what situations that would apply to the folks. The folks here, I know um, for water districts and fire districts, if they have, you know, fires or floods and they have to uh, you know, authorize more funding to the relief folks, um, they might have to have an emergency meeting. And uh, now for an emergency meeting, the only exception is the 24-hour posting requirement. And also with recess and resume. All of the other open meeting law laws apply. It's just uh, an exception for the 24-hour notice requirement. So in order for it to be an emergency meeting, in the case of an actual emergency, the law permits the board to meet, discuss, and decide matters with less than 24-hour notice. So how do you know if you're having an actual emergency? And it's how you know is due to unforeseen circumstances, immediate board action is necessary to avoid a serious consequence that will result from waiting until proper notice could be provided. So if you have an emergency meeting um, and you have some folks out there that really like to come to these meetings and um, they don't know about it, they're probably going to be a little upset about the emergency meeting. So you want to make sure that you uh, cover yourself so that you can properly justify that it's an emergency meeting. So you want to provide notice as soon as possible that you're going to be holding an, em an emergency meeting by way of posting an agenda. Announce in public at the meeting the reasons necessitating the emergency action. So say at the meeting why it's an emergency, why you fit in that definition. Include the reasons in the minutes and provide notice stating the emergency session occurred and providing information required on a normal agenda within 24 hours after the emergency meeting. Social events and seminars. Um, this is per particularly problematic in smaller towns or boards where there's a small quorum where the quorum is two or three members, um, and they frequently will find themselves at the same social events or seminars or just in, in public. Um, now, remember, it's only uh, an open meeting law issue if there's a gathering of the quorum and you're uh, discussing public business or something that could come before the public body. So if you're not discussing public business or something that could be coming before the public body, it's not regulated under open meeting law. However, if there's a gathering of the quorum and there's other folks from the public there, um, you want to be aware of how that looks. So you might consider posting a courtesy agenda announcing an event and explain that a quorum might be present. Identify the date, time, and purpose. Location details will vary depending upon the event. And state that no business of the public body will be discussed, no legal action will be proposed or taken, and members will be scrupulous to avoid improper discussion. Now, these types of agendas are not required, um, but it is that extra step toward transparency, and it is that extra step toward uh, you know, kind of heading off that, that, that public anger when someone, uh, when the public sees you at these social events or sees you at this public event and they say, oh, well, um, you know, we caught you. <laughs> you, know, you, you didn't think anybody was going to see you, but we caught you. Um, then you could say, oh, we, we knew we were all going to be here. We're not discussing public business. You know, this is not a violation. We, we put everybody on notice that we were going to be here. So the agenda, what's required to be on the agenda? It must list the specific matters to be discussed, considered, or decided, and must include information reasonably necessary to inform the public. All discussion must be reasonably related to an adequately described agenda item. So when you're looking at agenda items and how to word the agenda items, you want to put as much information on there that you know is going to be discussed. So that if somebody out there, the test is, if somebody out there in the public was interested in that subject matter, that they would know that that was 
what you were going to discuss. Common agenda problems, using language a person would not understand, you know, agency slang, acronyms, legalese, and general categories. I have a lot of trouble with general categories because people um, have general categories on their agendas that they've been using for 30 years, and they just recycle the agendas. So you're not allowed to use general categories. Uh, new business, old business, personnel reports, nobody has any idea what's going to be talked about, and the board cannot discuss, propose, or take legal action under any of these general headings because nobody knows what type of information you're going to talk about. Current events. This is one, uh, one nuance for the agenda. Uh, the chief administrator, presiding officer, or a member of the public body may present a brief summary of current events without listing on the agenda the spe specific matters to be summarized, provided that current events is an agenda item. So when, if somebody decides to get up and list current events, um, you, they can get, get up and give a presentation, basically. But you're not allowed to, the board isn't allowed to discuss or respond or take any kind of legal action in response to that. All they can do is uh, maybe propose that another topic be on a following agenda. That's the only, they have to treat it kind of like a call to the public. Um, there, you're not allowed to directly re react to that current event. You can't ask the guy questions. You can't, you can't have any kind of discourse between your, each other or with you and the person that's giving that current event summary. I've had some questions about um, can more than one person give um, current events, uh, give a presentation under current events, and I'm not really enthusiastic again, uh, about this provision. Um, I think that it, it has a lot of pitfalls, um, and I certainly would not recommend that more than one person give a uh, presentation under current events. So it's, if it's not on the agenda, you can't discuss it. Um, new items have to wait for a future meeting. Meeting locations. I don't know if if any of these would apply to the folks, the folks here. Um, inaccessibility. You can't have a meeting at a board member's house. You can't have a meeting in a remote location to try and prevent people from attending. Um, everybody has to be able to hear. There has to be enough room. Uh, unreasonable times. You can't have a, a meeting at six o'clock in the morning or ten o'clock at night. Um, I've tried to have, I, I've gotten questions about uh, when people move their uh, meeting from 6 o'clock at night to maybe 2 o'clock in the afternoon, um, and the complaint is, well, they're trying to prevent people from, uh, that are working, you know, regular, regular hours from attending. I, I, I don't think that that has a lot of support. Uh, unreasonable times would be you know, very early in the morning or very late at night. So not enough room is uh, kind of the more common problem if you have a meeting where there is a lot of public interest. There has to be enough room for uh, everybody to be in the in that room and here if you have if you don't have the ability to have a big enough room you want to look into overflow rooms that have a live audio feed and you have to be able to give those people the same access to um, the call to the public and whatnot as the folks in the regular room virtual meetings you can have a virtual meeting um, there's an attorney general opinion on it. So long as the public body meets all the other open meeting law requirements and promotes public access, provide clear notice and agenda, facilitates access, maintains meeting minutes, properly preserving all the documents created. Um, it, it's a little tricky, the virtual meetings, uh, depending on what type of format you're trying to have. So uh, you really want to work closely with your attorney um, to make sure that you're complying with all of the different concerns stated in this attorney general opinion. Public's rights. I don't know if we have any members of the public, but this is, uh, this is normally when they turn on me. They don't like this slide too much. <laughs> um, the public has the right to attend, 
listen, tape record, and videotape. Okay? And the public body, the public body meaning the board, can't require attendees to identify themselves or sign in um, unless they're getting up and talking during the call to the public. And then you can ask their name. You can ask them more things, but if they say, I'm not going to give you my address, I'm not going to give you my telephone number or whatnot, um, it, it, you can't prevent them from speaking. Um, but you, there's nothing that prevents you from asking those questions, but the only thing that they have to give you is their name for, so that you can accurately take the minutes. The public has no right to speak, and they have no right to disrupt. Um, so if you have a person that is being disruptive, using vulgar language, um, you have to provide warnings and make a good record of the warnings because if you remove that person, they are going to complain. Um, so you want to make a good record of warnings um, that they are being disruptive and they are going to be removed. Um, and they have to actually be disruptive. They can't just be saying something that you don't want to hear or saying a viewpoint that you don't want to hear. They have to actually be um, you know, disrupting the public body's ability to conduct their business. So calls to the public. Um, uh, calls to the public are not required. They are optional um, and less required by other laws, but they're not required by open meeting law. And I know there have been attempts in, by the legislature to make it a mandatory uh, provision, and those attempts have failed. You, when uh, there is a call to the public, uh, when the public gets up and starts talking, you can place time, place, and manner restrictions on them. Um, this is where you kind of get into the intersection of the First Amendment and the open meeting law. So it gets a little tricky. Um, you can limit their time. You can ban repetition. You may require speakers on the same side with no new comments to select a spokesperson, and you can prohibit dis disruptive behavior. What you can't do is you can't, um, you can't cherry pick based on the subject matter that they want to talk about. So comment pitfalls to the calls of the public calls to the public is discussing matters not listed on the agenda. Now, if uh, if someone gets up during the call to the public and they talk about something that is on the agenda, the public body is free to discuss it as much as they want. They don't have to. They can be quiet and not respond. But if it's on the agenda, you're free to talk about it, discuss it to the extent that it's listed on the agenda. So if it, these rules apply if it's not on the agenda. If the person gets up and starts talking about something that's not on that current agenda. So it's, if it's not on the agenda, the public body's response is limited to directing staff to study the matter, asking that the matter be placed on a future agenda, and responding to criticism. And all of these responses can only occur at the end of the call to the public. You can't respond individually to these folks that are talking about things that are not on the agenda. And this is also, as we talked before, about folks in the public not necessarily being experts on open meeting law. This is a good opportunity for you to explain this is what our responses are limited to. We're not ignoring what you're saying. We're going to address it at the end. Because I, I do get a lot of complaints from folks in the public that say, they didn't respond to me. Um, they don't care about what I'm saying. Don't they have to respond? <laughs> so you want to uh, make an effort to educate the folks at your meetings, educate the folks in your community. Some people put, um, put some, some language in their agenda about it that just talks about how the public body is limited, um, just so there's, it facilitates that relationship. So meeting ag etiquette, um, don't do any of this stuff. So don't pass notes, don't text, don't email, Re regardless of whether you're talking about, you know, things that are innocuous, people are going to assume that you're talking about public business. You shouldn't be talking about public business. 
Um, but, uh, you know, don't, don't look like you are, you know, having other conversations. Whispering to board members, talking with a quorum before the meeting officially starts or after the meeting officially ends. Um, I've seen, I've seen uh, um, video from public bodies where uh, folks in the public body just lean back from the mic and talk so you can't hear on the audio. <laughs> Don't do that. That's a bad idea. There, there, there's no reason for that. Um, executive sessions. These uh, executive sessions are where the public is excluded. So they're only permitted for specific matters. They must include the possibility of the executive session in the meeting notice and agenda. You have to vote to enter executive session. The discussion is confidential and you can't take any legal action in executive session. You can't vote in executive session and you have to have minutes or a recording. So executive sessions, we're gonna go through a lot. I, I know a lot of people have um, a lot of confusion about executive sessions and we're gonna go through a lot of the prov provisions at length. But for executive sessions, you wanna look at the provisions and just because you have some content that fits within the provision for an executive session, doesn't necessarily mean that you're required to have that in executive session. So depending on what the subject matter is, you the public doesn't like executive session. They they don't uh, they don't uh, they don't want to see you having executive sessions. They don't care if it's legal. <laughs> they they want you to be doing things in public. They want to know what's going on. So when you're considering whether you're going to have something in executive session, there should be some thought process as to whether you, you can have that in open session, whether you have to have it in executive session. Um, so for an executive session, it has to be in uh, the agenda and you have to include the specific statutory citation um, for, uh, it's uh, one through seven. You can't just put a general citation for the executive session statute. It has to be which specific one you're planning on having, and the agenda must provide, in addition to that statutory citation, a general description of the matters to be discussed or considered, and it has to be more than the citation, but it doesn't have to contain so much information that it defeats the whole purpose for having an executive session, but you want to provide as much information as you can, um, and, and this is where you want to evaluate What's already public knowledge? If it's already public knowledge that you have an ongoing litigation and uh, you know that's already public record in the court, uh, you and you're going to go in to get legal advice on that litigation, just put the case name on there. You know that the, the public already knows that you're the subject of litigation. So if you're getting legal advice on that case, you want to put that case name on there that you're getting legal advice on that case. Um, because you're not disclosing anything that isn't already out there, isn't already public knowledge. But you don't have to do anything that's going to compromise the legitimate interests of public officer appointee or employee or compromise your attorney-client privilege. So who can attend? Members of the public body, persons that are the subject of a personnel discussion, the Auditor General, individuals whose presence is reasonably necessary in order for the public body to carry out its executive session responsibilities. So a clerk to take minutes or run tape, an attorney to give legal advice. Um, I, I had some questions about uh, um, an executive director was routinely uh, included in the executive session. And I had a question about whether that was appropriate. And um, you really have to make a case whether that person is reasonably necessary in order for the public body to carry out its executive session responsibilities. Um, you know, it really depends on the subject matter of what they're discussing, whether that executive director would be, um, would be necessary or reasonably necessary. You want to put on record why the individuals attending are reasonably necessary. 
And uh, these are some of the pitfalls to executive sessions. Inappropriate disclosure, you're not allowed to disclose anything that happens in executive session. So uh, the chair is required by statute to remind members of the confidentiality requirement every executive session. And you can't vote. All votes have to take place in public. So we're going to start going through some of the uh, the provisions that you can have an executive session under personnel matters. Um, you may discuss and consider employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, demotion, dismissal, salaries, discipline, or resignation of an officer, appointee, or employee of the board. You must be able to identify a specific individual. You cannot have an executive session to have a general discussion about personnel. You, it has to be a specific individual. If the matter is noticed for a possible executive session for a personnel matter, you have to provide separate written notice to the employee that is the subject of that personnel discussion 24 hours prior to the meeting. Um, listing them on the agenda is not enough. You have to give them separate written notice. And the, the employee may require that, that that conversation happen in an open meeting. Uh, it doesn't include individual sal salary discussions. Um, the employee doesn't have the right to attend that executive session, but they can be invited to attend. <coughs> um, regardless of whether they're invited to attend or not, they can have access to the portion of the executive session uh, minutes or recording where they were discussed. Now, if a board says, okay, well, we're going to uh, have a personnel discussion, we're just going to have it in an open session. The subject of that personnel discussion does not have any right to require that that discussion happen in executive session. It only works one way. They can request that it happen in open session, but if the public body on its own initiative says, you know, we're just going to fire you in public, you do not have the option to say, let's have this discussion in executive session. It only works to get in the open. Common questions, may you conduct personnel evaluations in executive session? Uh, yes. You can review and interview applicants in executive session if the position is one appointed by the board. Uh, you must vote for appointment in public session. So all of the votes have to happen in the open session. Confidential information, this is another provision for which you can have a, um, a, uh, an executive session. Depending on what statutes apply to your public body, um, you can discussion or consideration of records exempt by law from public inspection. Um, a lot of public bodies have uh, provisions that say investigate by statute their investigative materials are confidential by statute so if they're going to discuss investigative materials they can't do that in open session because they'll be violating their own statutes so they have to go into um, into executive session to discuss those investigative materials um, you can receive and discuss information and testimony that state or federal law requires to be maintained as confidential. Discussion may occur in open session when the confidential information is adequately safeguarded. Uh, for example, if you were um, on a board that dealt with medical records, uh, you would have to go in executive session to discuss those medical records because you, you couldn't disclose those in open session. Legal advice, probably one of the most common executive sessions, discussion or consultation with legal advice for attorneys for the public body. It can't just be any attorney. Your attorney has to actually be there by phone or in person. You can't um, just review uh, you know, a, a memo in executive session. Um, members may not discuss among themselves of merits of what action to take debate over what action to take, pros and cons, policy implications of competing alternative courses of action. So this is intended just to, um, it's primarily supposed to be one-way communication from the attorney to the board. Uh, what's prohibited is discussing that legal advice among the members of the public body. Um, that discussion has to occur 
um, the discussion of what you're going to do with that information has to occur in open session. Other possible reasons for an executive session, discuss and consult with attorneys to consider litigation, contract negotiations and settlement, discussion regarding negotiation with employee organizations about salary, international, interstate and tribal negotiations, and discussion regarding negotiations for purchase, sale, or lease of real property. Minutes or a recording are required. However, you always have to have minutes. Um, library and archives require that all permanent records be on paper. So even if you have a recording, they eventually have to be um, they converted to minutes. Tape recordings must be retained for at least three months, but no more than five years. So after three months, you can destroy the tape recording if you have minutes. Contents of the meeting minutes. It's not a transcript. Um, so, you know, don't feel as though you have to write down everything ver verbatim that happens at that meeting. Uh, the statutory requirements are time, date, and place of the meeting, members present and absent, general description of the matters to skip, considered, accurate description of the legal action, names of the person, uh, names of the members who propose each motion, names of persons as given, making statements or presenting material to the public body, and a reference to the legal action about which they made statements or presented material. So you want to kind of a benchmark when you're doing minutes is, is it, would a board member or a member of the public know what happened at that meeting uh, if they were not there? Uh, you want it to be a good reference material for uh, another board member that uh, missed that meeting. Um, also about meeting minutes, I'm sure this doesn't apply to anyone uh, at this meeting, but avoid characterizing what people say. Um, she yelled, she complained, she whined. Uh, people's feelings get hurt and they don't like it, make it objective, Make it stale. Um, you're just asking for some public discord uh, by characterizing uh, people's comments. So access to the meeting minutes. Minutes or recording shall be open to the public inspection three working days after the meeting, not after approval. So if somebody comes in three working days after the meeting, and request meeting minutes or recording, you are required to produce them. If you just have draft minutes, you are required to give them a copy. You can't say, oh, well, uh, they're not approved yet, so we're denying your public records request. Um, that's why it's very beneficial to have a recording so if you have draft minutes that you're still working on, uh, you can offer that recording and not um, have to, because uh, most of the time folks that come in and ask for a, a copy of the minutes or recording, they're going to be very satisfied by having a recording. They're not going to be as interested in your unfinished draft minutes. Um, so meeting minutes for cities and towns, they have a little extra Extra requirements here. Cities and towns with a population of more than 2,500 shall post legal actions taken or any recording on its website within three working days. Post approved meeting minutes from the city or town council meetings on its website within two working days following approval. And the postings must remain on their website for one year. This only applies to cities and towns with a population of over 2,500. Uh, subcommittees and advisory committees uh, must take minutes or recording of all meetings, including executive sessions, and uh, within 10 working days after the meeting, they have some additional requirements if you're a subcommittee or advisory committee of a city or town with a population of over 2,500 or more, you must post a statement describing legal action or post any recording of the public meeting. Executive session minutes. You have to have minutes or recording uh, of your executive session. I suggest a recording. I know that there are um, there are some attorneys out there that 
recommend um, recommend not recording it and just having minutes. Um, if you are subject to enforcement action about your uh, your executive session from the attorney general's office, if you don't have a recording, they require everybody that was present at the executive session to file affidavits about what happened at that executive session. So you may be saving yourself some headaches to um, to just record it, and then you can provide the recording to the attorney general's office when they're investigating you. Because if somebody alleges that uh, you conduct an executive session improperly, uh, the public body has the burden to prove that it was properly done. As to include the date, time, and place of meeting, members present and absent, a general description of the matters considered, an accurate description of all instructions given, such other matters as deemed appropriate by the pu public body, and they shall be kept confidential. So they're only uh, disclosable to a limited amount of people, members of the public body, officers, appointees, or employees who were the subject of discussion or consideration, and only that piece that discusses them. The auditor general in connection with an audit, county attorney, attorney general, um, or me if I have, uh, am investigating your violations. Um, also, if, if you come onto a public body and you're, you're on a board, you do have access to the previous executive session minutes um, so that you don't make the same mistakes that the, the prior board may have made or you can uh, utilize that legal advice that they had um, that they got several years ago. Um, you also have access to the executive session minutes if you're on the board or council and you just miss that meeting. <laughs> so uh, you don't have to be actually present at that uh, executive session if you're on the board. Circumvention. Don't circumvent the open meeting law. It's very easy to pick up on <laughs> when people try. You can't use any de device to, open, to circumvent. Um, and this primarily talks to, uh, is speaking to serial communications um, where you go from uh, board member A to board, and then go to board member B and say, board member A told me this, board, and then you go down the line until you hit a quorum. You also can't ask people how they're going to vote. Um, that, that's, that's clear intent to violate the open meeting law. If you're asking people how they're going to vote, um, there's no other reasonable explanation for that other than setting up some sort of deal outside of the open meeting. So don't ask people how they're going to vote. Just let them vote that way. So going from one person to the next and sharing communications violates the open meeting law. Um, there's some, some material in the Arizona Agency Handbook about that. Nonverbal serial communications, letters. You can't write a series of letters from one member to the next until you've communicated um, to the quorum. Email occurring at different times will constitute a meeting in violation of, of the open meeting law. Simultane sim I don't know how to pronounce that one of these days. <laughs> Simultaneous uh, exchanges are not required to be a meeting. Um, I think a lot of you probably have some, some language on the bottom of your email that talks about replying all. Basically, you can't have a discussion uh, over email with a board member and then uh, forward that discussion to a quorum. That's basically the gist of it. So you can't use email among a quorum to propose legal action, discuss legal action, deliberate on legal action, or take legal action. So uh, emails exchanged among a quorum of the board that involve discussion, delib deliberations, or taking legal action on matters that may come before the board constitute a meeting and thus violate the open meeting law. Uh, I don't really have this in my presentation, but you also want to be um, very cautious of social media. Um, if you're talking about public business on social media, um, it's, it's very tricky. Um, especially if you have, you know, an open Facebook page, but 
you know, you're friends with a quorum of the board. If you put out a discussion about public business, it's clearly communicated to them. Um, it's really, it's really a, a hairy, hairy situation. <laughs> There's not a lot of guidance out there um, because it's more of a new, um, a new area. Uh, I would expect some guidance to come out in the next couple of years. But this is an example of uh, what we were talking about before. One member sends an email to two members, and there's a response shared among all three. You now have a discussion among three members, and three members is a quorum. So that's a violation. So um, this is where people get tripped up a lot. So... When you're talking about when there's a two-way exchange of information, there is no difference between facts and opinion. There's a, I get a lot of questions about, I'm just sharing facts. I'm just providing research. At, under open meeting law, if it's research or facts that discuss something that could come before the board, and there is a two-way exchange of information, that is a deliberation, collective acquisition of exchange of facts preliminary to a final decision outside of an open meeting. You can't do that. So that would be a violation if it's among the quorum. So uh, this is a, you know, a statement uh, disclaimer. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have these on your email. They're very common. Staff email. If you have staff, if you're one of the fortunate public bodies out there that has uh, full-time staff, uh, staff may send email to board members. Passive receipt of information without more does not violate the open meeting law. Staff can send the, the board board packets. Staff may not send opinion or substantive communication about board business from a board member to enough other board members to constitute a quorum. So it, the, the best practice is for staff to, um, you know, scale back all of the information and provide as objective of a presentation in their board packets as possible. So prohibitive one-way communication. A single board member may violate the open meeting law if they propose legal action among a quorum outside of a properly noticed meeting. So uh, this can happen um, just with one person. There can be no discussion. If one person puts this out there for the board uh, and proposes legal action, uh, that, that can be an open meeting law violation. You can't propose legal actions outside of a noticed meeting. So proposing an item for an agenda does not propose legal action. Uh, but you have to be careful that you're only communicating about the topic, that it's not the legal action that you want the board to take. So Councilperson Smith was admitted to the hospital last night, does not propose legal action. We should install a crosswalk at First and Main. Does propose legal action. It's more than just a topic because it urges or suggests an outcome. Here's a recipe for lemon bars I brought to the last meeting. Not sure why you would put that on your agenda. Um, I hope I can count on you in all favor of uh, agenda item number five. You know, it, it urges or suggests an outcome. I think we should consider firing the city manager at our next meeting. I would like to discuss the city manager's performance at our next meeting. Um, clearly, the second one is better, but uh, I, I would avoid talking about either of these to a quorum. Just put the city manager's performance on the agenda and wait until the next meeting. <laughs> There's no reason to discuss that outside of an open meeting in front of a quorum, you know, among a quorum. Staff and other persons cannot, you can't direct staff to communicate in violation of the open meeting law, and sanctions may be imposed upon any person who knowingly aids, agrees to aid, or attempts to aid another person in violating this article. Communications with the public. You're allowed to talk to the public. Um, you can express opinions and discuss issues at the public at a venue other than a public meeting 
personally or through media or other public broadcasts, so long as not intended to violate the open meeting law. So you can give interviews, um, the and you can you know talk to the public. Uh, you have to be sure and be careful that the material that you're talking about can't be construed um, as being intended to circumvent the open meeting law. So um, if you're giving an interview and you specifically address by name the people on the quorum and say, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, you know, that's pretty transparent that you're intending to circumvent the open meeting law. So discussion or opinion can't be principally directed at, at or directly given to other board members. There has to be no plan to engage in collective deliberation or take legal action. And there's uh, an attorney general opinion that talks about town hall meetings as well as uh, interviews. So when in doubt, um, and this is the same for the public records law, uh, resolve all doubts in favor of openness. So if you're in a situation where it's a gray area and um, it's arguable whether this can occur within an open meeting or outside of an open meeting, you want to err on the side of caution and have it in an open meeting. Remember, legal action taking at a meeting held in violation of any provision of the open meeting law is null and void unless ratified. So, when you violate the open meeting law, it happens. It's not, uh, it's not the end of the world. Uh, sometimes it happens. And um, how do you fix it, basically? Um, can you resolve the issue and continue? Does the open meeting law violation taint the whole meeting? Probably not. Uh, it depends on the, uh, the type of violation it is. Determine if you need to ratify the action. Um, consult your training materials. Consult that uh, attorney, uh, attorney general's handbook. You can call me and ask me if, um, whether the situation is an open meeting law violation, and I can give you some recommendations. If you receive a complaint, be responsive to the complaint. Don't, you know, ignore the person and make them more angry. Um, and go over your materials. If you have um, recordings, if you have videotapes, go over those materials so that you can evaluate whether a violation occurred. So if you violated the open meeting law and you decide that you want to ratify, um, there are specific uh, requirements for ratification so you can preserve that vote. So if you have a vote and you want to preserve that vote and preserve the date of that vote, you're required to, within 30 days after discovery of the violation or when it should have been discovered within reasonable dil or reasonable, with reasonable diligence, <laughs> to ratify. Um, and for that meeting, you have to notice 72 hours prior to the meeting, a description of the action to be ratified, a clear statement that the body proposes to ratify the prior action. This has to be on your agenda. And information how the public can obtain a written detailed description of the action. If you go to the Arizona uh, Agency Handbook, they have sample forms for all of these ratification steps. So you want to make sure that you really mirror closely their sample forms so that you don't have to ratify your ratification. So, <laughs> you know, you already, you know, stumbled. You want to make sure that you get it right the second time around. So the written description, this doesn't have to be in the agenda, but you have to have materials available upon request of the action to be ratified, all of the preceding deliberations, consultations, and decisions that preceded and related to the action, and that packet has to be included in the minutes. If one agenda item is improper, the remainder of the agenda is most likely valid. The most common uh, scenario is if one of the agenda items was not specific enough. You know, you used a general category. Or um, I had a situation where uh, the public body was buying property and uh, they didn't 
list the address of the property. Um, and if, if you're buying property, and they didn't even, they didn't list that it was even real estate. They, they just listed property. So it was unclear what type of property they were buying. So uh, that material needed, that vote needed to be ratified because it wasn't clear that they were buying real property um, or where that real property was. Uh, however, that doesn't make everything on the agenda null and void, just that particular vote. Um, if an item is, uh, if an, the improper item involves the entire agenda, all the actions are invalid. So that comes into play if you miss the 24-hour notice requirement, if you don't post your agenda, um, or if you post the wrong time, wrong location. That's going to nullify your whole meeting. Other things that nullify your whole meeting is if, um, if the door was locked and the public couldn't get in, that's going to nullify your whole meeting. Uh, penalties. Members and any persons who aid, attempt, or agree to aid are subject to a civil penalty of up to $500 for each violation. Such equitable relief as the court deems appropriate and reasonable attorney's fees. If an intent to deprive the public information is found, the court may remove the public officer from office and charge the officer and any person that aided, agreed to aid, or attempted to aid all costs and attorney's fees. Um, there is also a statute that when you're defending an open meeting law uh, uh, litigation, you cannot use public funds. So you're prohibited from using public funds for that defense. And these are some resources that we talked about on our website, um, uh, there's the Arizona Agency Handbook. Um, we have a handbook, but it's pretty outdated. I'm working on updating it uh, with some of the new statutes. Uh, we also have some frequently asked questions on our website. Uh, library and archives, they will be a great help for how to preserve your open meeting law materials that are you're required to retain as permanent records. Um, there's also uh, not, there's not a ton of case law out there, but there is some case law. And the Attorney General opinions are actually really helpful. If you go to the Attorney General's website, they do have several opinions on some of these more nuanced issues. So that's it. I think we're, does anybody in the room have a question before we get to, uh, the online questions, if they have any. Um, the gentleman is asking about location of meetings with regard to um, Department of Corrections being in, uh, I guess, where, where are the meetings normally held? We normally have them at the central office. At the central office. <sighs> OK. But the public would have access to the meeting. Be a little scary, but <laughs> um, I don't think it would be prohibited um, as long as it was uh, it was noticed properly. Um, it's kind of tricky with a state agency because it's not like a city or a town where you have to have your your meeting within within the city or town reasonably um, or reasonably close so people can attend, um, you would just have to do an evaluation about what material was on um, that, that agenda and be careful that you're not trying to exclude people from your meeting and facilitate people attending that from the other locations, you know, whether you had um, people apply, you know, appear telephonically or whether the public could attend telephonically. Um, I, I think that you would have to look at, you know, facilitating access if you were going to change your location to a remote location like that because um, those are, you know, several hours away from where you normally have your meetings. So um, I, I would look at, uh, you know, how you were going to facilitate access if you uh, did you know, change them to a remote location. But I, I'd be hesitant to say that it's prohibited. I'd also be hesitant to say, you know, there's a green light because you'd have to look and see if 
um, if there's an intent to exclude people. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, um, some of our boards are part of political subdivisions, like, for instance, our, our police officers and our fire departments, you know, obviously mm -hmm. are under, like, cities or towns. Mm -hmm. And they may have their own website. The police department may have their own website. Mm -hmm. uh, are they, per open meeting law, required to post not only on their website, or are they required to actually post on the town website? The town has, like, their own mm -hmm. general website. What have you... I have to double check the statute, but I think they're only required to post on their own website. Um, but I'll have to double check the, the agenda requirement. Um, I think they have the option to post on the city or town website if they don't have their own. Um, they can uh, they can uh, post on uh, the Arizona League, or they have those options to to do that if they don't have their own. But if they have their own website. Um, I, I can't think off the top of my head of an obligation to uh, post on another public body's website. So, so this is a, uh, this is a question. What's my role? That's a great question. I love talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for me specifically, my role is uh, uh, different from the other folks in our office. Our primary role is mediation. Um, to resolve uh, disputes between folks in government and folks in the public. That's our primary role. Now, um, if we have, if we find a situation where we think that the public body is in clear violation of the law, we do have an obligation to report to the legislature. Um, but uh, primarily, uh, our role is to um, explain to the public body what their obligations are, explain to, um, explain to the, the public what the public body is required to do, and facilitate them being able to use their rights of public access and uh, making sure that the folks in government are um, are complying with the rights of access that the public body ha or the, the members of the public have. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the question was about um, was about taking a would I recommend taking a picture of a, an agenda that's posted with the date and time uh, as evidence that you posted. Uh, the agenda at the physical location if, so, if you had a problem with somebody tearing it down. Um, whatever uh, procedure you want to go with as far as uh, keeping a record of the posting is really up to you. Um, uh, I think that if there's a pattern of people ripping down the physical posting, uh, I would recommend that you take the 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 next step to prevent that. Um, if it's something that just happens once or twice, you know maybe that would be a um, an option to just demonstrate that you posted it. But I think that if if it becomes a pattern and people are always ripping down that physical location posting, you start to get into an issue of. You really not provide. You know it's going to be ripped down, even though it's not your fault. You know how how are you providing notice to to the community of of that meeting? So, um, yeah, uh, if if there is a pattern where um, your notices are being uh, tampered with, you want to uh, reconsider. You know what your procedure is, but as far as protecting yourself from that 24-hour requirement, you know, that's a fair way to ensure that, you know, if somebody comes back and challenges it, that you say, oh, you know, we did post it, and people are tearing it down. Uh, but if it does become a pattern, uh, I, I would recommend that the public body look into getting a case um, or uh, getting some other assurances or moving the posting location to uh, someplace inside uh, that maybe uh, assures that that's not going to happen. Any other questions? Good. Oh, okay. Um, with the handout, I put some um, some forms at the end. Uh, these were just some uh, forms that I thought were um, 
pretty common. These are from the Arizona Agency Handbook. I, I talked a little bit about um, these forms uh, during the presentation. Um, it's a sample uh, notice of a public, this is a, let's see. What is this? <laughs> no, this is a sample of um, the, uh, the notice doesn't have an agenda, but um, this is a, an example for a notice for a subcommittee or advisory committee, um, notice of a regular meeting, um, you know, just sample language for you to go with, notice of a possible executive session, um, and these other things. Oh, it's a sample for a combined uh, public meeting and executive session. Um, a lot of people use, uh, um, have the, the legal, uh, legal advice provision on all of their meetings about, uh, you know, uh, an executive session for legal advice for any of the agenda items um, on there. Uh, and that's okay if you want to have some disclaimer language on there for legal advice. Um, and then there's a sample agenda. Uh, and the reason why I included the sample agenda form 7.7 .7 is because it does have um, some of those general categories, but it has the specific description underneath it. Um, so I wanted to illustrate that if you are going to have a general category like personnel, the extent that you have to go to uh, underneath it to be more specific. Um, let's see. That's a long agenda. Certification of posting notice, you know, that's, you can use that for your own records to um, certify that you posted um, the material just to keep a record of the 24-hour notice. I've also seen people just, um, uh, you know, initial and, you know, initial and timestamp the agenda. Notice of a special meeting um, or emergency meeting. Uh, minutes, there are some uh, samples of minutes. Minutes of an executive session, you know, that would, uh, it has all the requirements for the statutory requirements so you can just walk through and fill them in. Um, I, I also included some material from ratifying because that's where um, people seem to have the most, uh, most trouble. Um, when you're giving notice about ratification, um, the statute really walks through all the requirements, but there are several requirements. So you want to make sure that you're really satisfying each statutory requirement in the notice um, and providing the, the detailed written description of the action that you're supposed to be providing. Um, and then there's a sample employee notice if you are having an executive session for to discuss personnel and you are giving the employee separate written notice, there's a sample of the letter that you can give to the employee. There's also some other forms. This isn't the entirety of the forms in the Arizona Agency Handbook, but these are just, yeah, they're just samples. Um, there's some other ones that are in there that you know, may apply to your situation. If there's no further questions, this concludes our seminar and presentation on the open meeting law presentation. Thank you for attending and appreciate the questions and comments during the presentation. Have a good day. Bye-bye.